In video 70 of Tensor Calculus, we'll illustrate the evaluation of the Christoffel symbol for each of our sample surface manifolds. In order to evaluate the Christoffel symbol for our surface manifolds, we can use either of two methods, and we'll illustrate both of those methods in this video. The first method is just to do what we did back in video number 31, and that is to apply our basic formulas First of all, this one for the Christoffel symbol of the first kind, uh, using the partial derivatives of each of our elements of our covariant metric tensor right over here. Okay, and once we do that, then we can contract those results with our contravariant metric tensor, and that will raise the index to get our Christoffel symbol of the second kind. Okay, now this method works, uh, as I say, back in video 31, it works for any manifold. So this is uh, just going to be the same method we used back in video 31. Okay, well for the cylindrical surface that we're looking at here, you'll notice that all the elements of the covariant metric tensor are constants. And that means that all of these partial derivatives are going to be zero. And thus all of the Christoffel symbols of the first kind and the second kind are going to be zero. So for the cylindrical surface, the answer is quite trivial. We'll just move down here and we'll drop that in place like this. So for the cylindrical surface all of the Christoffel symbols are equal to zero. Okay, so let's move on now to the spherical surface. So here's our formula for our Christoffel symbol of the first kind. So it uh, means that we first have to look at the partial derivatives. So remember how this works. We look at our covariant metric tensor over here and find all of the possible partial derivatives that could be expressed over here. Well, it's only one. Three of these elements are constant, so all of those partials are zero. This element right here is the only variable uh, element, and it is dependent only upon theta. So that means that the partial derivative of S22 with respect to S1 is the only non-zero partial derivative. And that value is going to be equal to 2a squared sine theta cosine theta. So that's the only non-zero partial derivative that will apply to our formula here. Now that means that the uh, only non-zero Christoffel symbols have to be those in which the indexes are some permutation of the values 1, 2, and 2. So uh, that means that we're going to be looking for this Christoffel symbol of the first kind, gamma 1, 2, 2. Or we could also find a value for gamma of 2, 1, 2, or gamma 2, 2, 1. Now, I've listed these last two as being equal because you'll remember that the last two indexes here, second two indexes, are symmetric. So these values will be the same. So these are the only possible non-zero Christoffel symbols of the first kind because this is the only non-zero partial derivative. Okay, so let's work our way through it here. Um, for uh, alpha is equal to 1, then this value is going to be represented right over here, and the other two values are going to be 0. So we'll have a negative sign of this times a half. That means that our value for gamma 1, 2, 2 is going to be equal to negative a squared sine theta cosine theta. And for the case where alpha is equal to 2 and beta is equal to 1, this value will represent this term, the other two being 0. So this is going to be a positive a squared sine theta cosine theta. All right, so with that, we've got the Christoffel symbols of the first kind. And what we need to do now is to raise the index to get the Christoffel symbols of the second kind. So we're going to be looking for gamma 1, 2, 2, and gamma 2, 1, 2, 
and gamma 2, 2, 1. Now to raise the index, we contract with our contravariant metric tensor. So um, because we have a diagonal matrix here, that's just a single term in each case. So all we have to do is to multiply this expression by S11, which is 1 over A squared. That means that our Christoffel symbol of the second kind is just going to be negative sine theta cosine theta here. All right, and then to raise the index of this guy, we have to multiply by this term right over here. And when we do that, the A squareds cancel out, and we're going to wind up with a sine theta in the denominator. So this result is cosine theta divided by sine theta. And that's the result for our spherical surface. All right, let's uh, move down. And we will drop those in place. Here's the Christoffel symbol of the first kind. And here are the Christoffel symbols of the second kind. All right, we'll move on now to the torus. And we'll go through the same drill. Here's our formula. So the first step is going to be to find all of the non-zero partial derivatives. And there's only going to be one because this is the only element that is a variable, and it's dependent only on phi, which is our second surface coordinate value here. OK, so uh, the only non-zero value is going to be the partial of S11 with respect to S2. All right, and for that, we're going to have uh, 2 times A plus B cosine phi. And then we'll need to take the partial of this term in here, which is going to be a negative b, and I'll put the b here, times the sine of phi, like this. So that is the partial derivative of S11 with respect to S2. And it's the only non-zero value. OK, so to find the Christoffel symbols of the first kind, the only ones that will be non-zero are those where the permutation of um, alpha, beta, and omega are some permutation of 2, 1, 1. So we're going to be looking for gamma 2, 1, 1, or gamma 1, 2, 1, which will be the same as gamma 1, 1, 2. Again, because the second two indexes are symmetric here. OK, so in the first case, where alpha is 2, that means that uh, our derived value here is this third term. And the other two are, are 0. We have a negative here and a negative there. So this value is going to be equal to a positive b times a plus b cosine phi times sine phi. All right, and in the other cases, where alpha is 1, it's going to be one of these two terms. It's not 0. This one will be 0, and only one of those will be positive. So we're going to have this term times a half. So it's going to be negative b times a plus b cosine phi times the sine of phi. All right. Uh, Next step, then, will be to raise the index. And uh, again, we have a diagonal matrix here in our contravariant metric tensor. So it's just a single term here. So to raise this guy, we multiply this term by S22, which is 1 over B squared. So what we're going to have is uh, gamma 2, 1, 1 is going to be this term times this one. So that's going to be 1 over b times a plus b cosine phi and sine phi. All right, the second case then, gamma 1, 2, 1, which is the same as gamma 1, 1, 2, is going to be this term multiplied by S11, which is right up here. So this has a squared term that will cancel out one of these. 
So this result is going to be negative b sine phi divided by a plus b cosine phi. And that's the result we're looking for. So let's move down here and put that in place. These are the Christoffel symbols of the first kind. And these are the Christoffel symbols of the second kind. All right, so we've evaluated all of the Christoffel symbols for our sample surfaces using the first method that uh, is available to us. But now I want to illustrate the second method, and for that we'll go over to the drawing board. Here we have the conversion formulas we derived in the last video. We said that we can calculate the Christoffel symbol for the surface if we know the Christoffel symbol for our ambient coordinate system and these other factors which are derivatives of our shift tensor. And we also said that if the ambient coordinate system is an affine coordinate system that the Christoffel symbols are all going to be zero so this whole term drops out and we can use this formula. Well that certainly is the case for all the sample surfaces that we've been dealing with. The ambient coordinate system is just the Cartesian coordinate system. So we can use this formula to derive our surface Christoffel symbols. Okay, so let's illustrate this with the um, derivation of these Christoffel symbols for our spherical surface. And for that we're going to need the shift tensor and the inverse shift tensor. So this is what we have for a spherical surface. Now, uh, to illustrate how this works, let's just uh, start by trying to find the values for gamma 1, 2, 2. Okay, now that means that alpha is 1, beta is 2, and omega is 2. So um, if that's the case, then if alpha is 1, then we're going to be dealing with the inverted shift tensor elements where alpha is 1. And that's all the guys along this row right here. And we're also going to be dealing with the shift tensor where beta is equal to 2. That means the second column of our shift tensor. So we're talking about these guys right over here. So we're going to form uh, sum of three products, this i being a dummy index, of course, means we're going to use this term with the first here, second with the second, third with the third. But we have to find the partial derivative of our shift tensor element with respect to S2, which um, 2 is the phi variable right here. So here's how it would work. First of all, we find the uh, first element in this row. We take 1 over A times the cosine theta cosine phi, and then we're going to multiply that by the partial derivative of this first element over here with respect to phi. So this is going to be negative a sine theta cosine phi. All right, then we're going to add to that the second element here, 1 over a cosine theta sine phi times the partial derivative of this second element with respect to phi. Well, that's just negative a sine theta sine phi. And then finally, negative 1 over a sine theta times the derivative of 0 with respect to phi. So this last term is just going to be 0. OK, so let's expand these out. The A cancels 1 over A. We're left with um, negative, uh, what is it, sine theta, cosine theta, cosine squared phi. And the second term, 1 over A, cancels A. Again, it's a negative term. And we have, again, sine theta cosine theta, and this time sine squared phi. All right, we can factor out the uh, negative sine theta cosine theta term, which is common to both of these, and we're left with cosine squared phi p 
plus sine squared phi, which of course this is equal to 1. So that means that this part of the term right here is the result. So you see it right up here. We've got this is the result for gamma 1, 2, 2. All right, so let's uh, do one more example then. So let's derive the value for gamma 2, 1, 2 this time. All right, so now if that's the case, then alpha is equal to 2, and that means we're going to be dealing with the elements along this row, and beta is 1, which means we're going to be dealing with the elements of this column, and again, omega is 2, so we'll be taking the partial derivative with respect to phi here. So let's see how that works out. We'll start with the first term here being negative sine phi over a sine theta. And that times the partial of the first element with respect to phi, which will be what? Negative a cosine theta and sine phi. All right, second term is going to be this second term here, cosine phi over a sine theta times the partial of the second term with respect to phi, a cosine theta cosine phi. And then this term times the partial of this with respect to phi both of those are zero, so this term is just zero. Okay, now what do we do? We look for all the common terms here. Uh, negative and negative gives us a positive. The a's cancel out. We have um, what well, we've got uh, cosine theta over sine theta. And then we've got sine squared phi. The second term here, it's positive. The a's cancel out. Again, we have cosine theta over sine theta. And this time, cosine squared phi. And the same thing happens that happened before. We can factor the common factor out. We're left with sine squared, cosine squared. So together, these resolve to cosine theta over sine theta. And that, then, is the value for gamma 212 right here. Okay, you can look back to an earlier portion of the video and see that these are exactly the same values that we got a few minutes ago. Okay, I think you get the idea. I'll let you work through the other examples on your own. In the next video, we're going to begin the analysis of the surface covariant derivative.